my second video on utility theory and utility maximization. In the first video, we did an overview kind of using a table to get a basic idea of some of the moving parts, some of the pieces that go into utility maximization. What we're going to be focusing on today is just the utility part. We're not going to be looking at the budget constraint. We're just going to really make sure we understand the idea of what we say when we mean a utility function, how utilities measured, marginal utility and all that. So grab your calculator. I highly recommend that you print this out. I'll have a link so that you can download this entire handout that's several pages long and you can work along with me. This is the kind of material where if you don't regularly pause the video, engage with the material, use your calculator, it's going to be much harder to get. So let's dive in. So as I mentioned in the previous video, when you're talking about maximizing utility, there are two pieces that go into it. The first piece is what are your preferences? If we're going to try to model someone maximizing utility, we need to have a way to model people's preferences. How much do people like different combinations of goods? The second piece, the budget equation and budget lines, that's the piece of what are the combinations that you can actually afford. And when we put those two ideas together, we can figure out the thing you can afford that also maximizes your utility. So let's dive into that utility part. When we think about utility, what we're really trying to do is model someone's preferences. One way to think about modeling somebody's preferences is just to sit them down and give them a very long survey asking them, okay, what do you like? This or this? Which is better? Which do you prefer? And so what we have to assume, if we're going to have a theory of preferences, is it all starts with assuming that people are rational. Now, in this context, what we mean when we say people are rational, we need two fundamental assumptions. Assumption number one, we have to assume that people's preferences are transitive. So we're going to assume transitivity. The idea of transitivity just means that if I give you a choice between two baskets, by basket we mean a bundle of goods. One basket might have three kittens and two bottles of water in it, and then another basket could have three best-selling novels and a pizza. And we might ask you, which of these two baskets do you prefer, the one with the kittens or the one with the pizza? Transitivity is the following idea. If I show you two baskets, A and B, and you tell me that you prefer A to B, a little symbol that we use for prefer, it looks like a greater than sign, but actually it has a little bit of a curve to the little ends there. So what I've written here, we would say A is preferred to B. I like A better than B. Transitivity requires that if somebody is rational, that if somebody says they prefer A to B, and then they also tell us that they prefer B to C, B is better than C, then what logically has to be true? That has to, if it's transitive, it has to imply that they like A better than C. If somebody says they like apples better than bananas, and bananas better than cookies, then they cannot logically turn around and say that they like cookies better than apples. Now, somebody could say that, but if they do, they're being irrational, and we're not going to be able to model their choices in a rational kind of theory, okay? So that's requirement number one. People's preferences have to be transitive. The second piece is their preferences have to be complete. Completeness is just a requirement that for any two baskets that I show people, they can answer in one of the following three ways. They can either tell me that A is preferred to B, or they could say B is preferred to A, or the third possibility would be that they're about the same. So A, a lot of times we'll use a little squiggle like this, B. 
this little A squiggle B or A tilde B is interpreted as A and B. They're just two things I'm indifferent between. Indifferent means you like them the same or so nearly the same that you can't tell me any difference. You can't perceive any difference between these two baskets. Completeness just requires that you can answer the question and you don't throw up your hands and say, I don't know. I just can't answer. So completeness says you can just answer. You like one better than the other or they're about the same. And John von Neumann is one of these brilliant people who most other brilliant people, if you were to give a survey and ask them, okay, list the 10 most brilliant people that have ever lived. For most people, John von Neumann would be one of the top 10 people on this list. So let me show you just a little bit about John von Neumann. So credit goes to Wikipedia here. John von Neumann, he was a mathematician by training, but he also gets credit for doing a lot of work in economics, uh, particularly in game theory. He also did some physics. He is certainly not the person we would credit with inventing computers, but he is one of a very small group of people who took the basic idea of computers, made them much, much, much more useful. So John von Neumann, uh, during World War II, he was one of the people on the Manhattan Project that was in charge of trying to uh, invent nuclear weapons. And a lot of the work that he did with computing helped with that effort as well. One of the things that economists know him very well for is he more or less was responsible, along with his co-author, Oscar Morgenstern, for inventing the field of game theory. They really laid a lot of the fundamental groundwork that had to be done before anybody could really do any serious work with game theory. They really laid a solid foundation so that when John Nash got to work on game theory, he had some things to chew on. So John Nash did a lot of work to make game theory much more useful, of course. But this book was originally published in 1944, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. So imagine that this book was one of many efforts done in the United States by the Department of Defense. They were hiring economists, mathematicians, logicians, uh, people who were trying to figure out ways to analyze the opposition. And so some of what was going on here in the theory of games and economic behavior was trying to formalize some ways to try to analyze and help with military strategy. While they were working on this book, one of the first things they had to do was logically prove that if you're going to analyze people's preferences, can we use numbers to represent people's happiness, satisfaction, or utility, as we call it? And using some really ingenious strategies that we don't really have time to go into, into this, in this class, he was able to show a really convincing way that, yes, we can use numbers, we can use mathematics to model people's happiness. Again, assuming that we have these assumptions of transitivity and completeness. Kind of impressive that that's really all we need in order to do this. Let me just read to give you a little bit of idea of some of the things he was considering in this very long book. Just read a couple of sentences here. So he said, this procedure for a numerical measurement of the utilities of individuals depends, of course, on the hypothesis of completeness in the system of individual preferences. Now, some people criticize economists for some of these rational assumptions that we force on people. We also know that often these assumptions aren't realistic, but they're necessary assumptions in order to kind of get a theory of decision making and a theory of choice going. Von Neumann and Morgenstern realize and, and put it in the book here. It is conceivable and may even in a way be more realistic to allow for cases where the individual is neither able to state which of two alternatives he prefers, nor that they are equally desirable. In this case, the treatment by indifference curves becomes impractical, too. What he's saying here is some of these assumptions, transitivity and completeness, he's talking about completeness here, it might not really be the case in the real world, but it's a necessary assumption if we're going to use this theory. 
for cases when people can't choose or they just can't make a decision. An example, and I hate to bring up a difficult example, but this is a very good example of when somebody may not be able to tell us a choice, is what if we, we made somebody choose? There's a terrorist, and they have kidnapped someone's family, and the terrorist forces them to choose. Well, which would you prefer to be let free from the terrorist's clutches, uh, your wife or one of your children? A lot of us would freeze and not be able to make a rational choice in that situation. And in those kinds of situations where we can't choose, this theory is going to fall apart, of course. All right. So as long as in most of the cases, we think that most people could make choices that are both transitive and complete, this theory works just fine. Some other assumptions, most of the time we're going to have lurking in the background when we're talking about these things, is we're usually going to also assume that when we're talking about goods X and Y, and we're, we haven't given them names, we're going to assume that more is better. So we're going to assume that whatever these things are, more of them is preferred to less. Now, this isn't always the case in the real world. Pollution, more pollution isn't preferred to less. However, in those cases, we can always turn what we're talking around into the negative. Instead of talking about more pollution, say that X is less pollution or X is cleaner air, cleaner water. So you can always kind of flip it on its head to make it into a more is better situation. Second thing we're normally also going to assume is people get more utility, more happiness when they have more but it's at a decreasing rate. And usually we'll call this idea decreasing or diminishing marginal utility. So the idea is just that the third hamburger is not gonna taste as good as the second or increase our utility as much as the second did. And the second hamburger probably isn't gonna make us as additionally happy as the first one did. So just to illustrate some basic simple things, let's calculate some numbers very quickly here. Let's assume we had a simple utility function just with one input, H, so hamburgers perhaps, and this plug in the number of hamburgers that you have to eat and the number that pops out, we're gonna call your utility. Now let me just stress that the actual numbers that come out of utility functions are not what's important. What really is important is if something has a higher number for utility, that that has to be something that is more preferred than something that has less utility. The actual number itself isn't that important. It's the relative size of the number. So, there are a lot of different functions that would give us the same kind of preferences where somebody would like more hamburgers, right? So let's fill out a little table here and I'll, I'll do the first couple. Then I'll ask you to pause the video and calculate some of these. Well, let's suppose we had zero, one, two, three, maybe even four hamburgers here. And we wanted to calculate how much utility that would give someone. Now, if we had zero hamburgers, that would be zero utility here from hamburgers, right? And if we had one hamburger, the square root of one is one. The square root of two is about 1.41. The square root of three is about 1.73 or so. So 1.73. And then if we had four hamburgers, that would be two, right? What about the marginal utility of each additional hamburger? Here we're just looking at how much additional happiness each hamburger gives us, not looking at the total. The easiest way to think about marginal utility is just to subtract how much utility you get for having, say, eaten one hamburger minus how much utility you had with one less. Now, since we can't do that when we have not eaten any hamburgers at all, the marginal utility of the zero hamburger doesn't really make sense. But the marginal utility of the first hamburger, 
How much additional happiness would be one minus zero, so that's one. The marginal utility of the second hamburger would be 1.41 minus one, or so 0.41 utils of additional happiness. And then the marginal utility of the third hamburger would be 1.73 minus 1.41, so that's about 0.32. So one thing I want us to notice here is that the marginal utility is decreasing. So just like we said here, we have decreasing marginal utility. Another way to think about marginal utility instead of subtraction is to use calculus. And in economics, anytime we have a function that gives us a total, whether it's total cost or total revenue or total utility, if you take the derivative of a total function, it gives you a marginal function. And so if we have a function like utility equals h to the 0.5, then marginal utility is going to be the derivative of utility with respect to hamburgers, right? So let me zoom in there. What's that derivative going to be? Yeah, you know it. Multiply by the exponents would be 0.5 times, and then subtract 1 from the exponent. 0.5 minus 5, so times h to the 0.5 minus 1 power is minus 0.5. Now, we could rewrite that if we wanted to this way. 0.5 is the same as 1 half, and h to the minus 0.5 is the same as the square root of 0.5, but in the denominator, right? The minus says put it in the denominator, and the 0.5 is the same as the square root. So we could write it this way, that marginal utility is 1 over 2 times the square root of h. Let's calculate marginal utility of each hamburger using this derivative method. And let's compare what we get, and then I'll show you what the difference is. Pause the video and see what you get when you calculate these marginal utility of the 0, 1, 2, 3 hamburger using this formula. Okay, if we try to plug in 0 into this function, we're going to get an error, right? Undefined. Now, what we mean by undefined in this case is that this slope, this marginal function, remember derivatives tell us a slope, that the slope of this function at zero is infinite. Let's look at the plot of the function over here. As we go towards h going to zero, we're going to think about this as a limit, right? The limit of the slope of this function, over here it's kind of flat, but as we get to x closer and closer and closer to zero, see how this function gets steeper and steeper and steeper? So that's telling us that the, the limit of the slope or in the limit, the marginal utility goes to infinity. So let me just write that there. Then in the limit, the marginal utility equals infinity at zero, or goes to infinity at zero. These other ones are a little more straightforward. When you plug in one here, you're just gonna get a half, one over two times the square root of one. And the marginal utility of the second, I got about 0.35. And for the third, I got about 0.29. Why are we getting different answers when we use the derivative method compared to the subtraction method? Because really what we're doing is calculating two different things. And they're both useful depending on the context. Let's look at the graph so that I can illustrate the difference here. If we look at the marginal utility being 1 here of the first hamburger, the way we really calculated that by looking at a slope. Now, what slope were we looking at? We said that if we start here at having 0 hamburgers and we end here at having 1 hamburger, what that 1 slope tells us is that as we eat that first hamburger, on average, we're enjoying it at the rate of one util per hamburger. Let that soak in for a minute. 
So the rate, the slope at which utility is going up on average as we consume that first hamburger is at the rate of going up one for every one hamburger we get. But we see that's not the slope the whole time during eating that hamburger. It's really steep at the beginning, meaning that first bite is really good. And the last bite is a little less good. But on average, we enjoy that hamburger at the rate of one util per hamburger. What about the second hamburger? Well, the second hamburger, again, if we look at using the subtraction method here, says that in between these two points, from the end of the first hamburger to the end of the second hamburger, right? Or we could think about the beginning of the second hamburger to the end of the second hamburger. During that point in time, we are, we are enjoying that hamburger at the rate of 0.41 per hamburger on average. But the slope at the beginning of the second hamburger and the end of the second hamburger is going to be a little different because it's a curve. The marginal utility formula here, using the derivative, the derivative tells us the slope of a function at a point. And so, as we were saying before, the slope there at zero is infinitely steep. The slope at one hamburger there is 0.5. And the slope at the end of the second hamburger is 0.35. So the way we can interpret these, again, is as I take the first bite of the first hamburger, it's really infinitely good, but it doesn't last very long. As I finish the first hamburger and as I start the second hamburger, I'm enjoying the hamburger at the rate of 0.5. My utility is increasing at the rate of 0.5 per hamburger. But as I end the second hamburger, my utility is going up at the rate of 0.35. And then, of course, as we end the second hamburger and begin the third hamburger, the rate at which utility is going up, if we were to draw a tangent line there, is at a slope of 0.29. Neither calculation is necessarily right. It just depends on what we're trying to answer. What kind of question are we looking at? If we want to know the average amount you enjoyed a hamburger, then the subtraction method is probably better. If we want to know the rate at which utility is going up at a specific point, then the marginal utility function is better. Most of the time, what we're going to be doing as we maximize utility doing these constrained optimization problems is we're going to be looking at the derivative interpretation. And we're going to assume that just to keep things a little simpler, believe it or not, that people can buy any amount of a good they want. It doesn't have to be one or two. It could be 1.53 units. So think about buying pounds of cheese where you can get them to slice off any amount you want or buying gallons of gas. Now that's the simple introduction. We're just looking at one good at a time. Now we're going to have a little bit more complicated utility function where there are two possible things we can spend our money on. And this is where it gets interesting because now people have to make a choice. Oh, I don't just have to spend my money on hot dogs. I have to choose how many hamburgers do I want? How many Cokes do I want? Right? So here, because you have two things, you force trade-offs and you force choice. And that's when the economic modeling gets interesting. Here, let's let the X value be, say, hamburgers, and the Y be, say, Cokes to go along with the hamburgers. Let's not look at what you can afford yet. Let's just analyze some situations to see what happens. Suppose somebody handed us three of each, X and Y. How much utility would this person get if their utility function was X to the 0.2 times y to the point 0.8. Calculate it. Yeah, of course we can simplify that to 3 to the point 0.2 times 3 to the point 0.8 equals 3 to the 1. Our utility would equal 3 utils in that case. Okay, I want you to pause the video now and I want you to calculate to get practice these other two cases here. 
what if we gave this person one more Y, one more Coke to drink, how much would their utility be and what would the marginal utility be of that fourth Y? Just use the subtraction method here. Then calculate how much utility you'd get for the fourth X, assuming you still had three Y, and the marginal utility of that fourth X, okay? And then come back to the video. So when you plug those numbers in, I got 3.78 utils if we had three X's and four Y's, and 3.18 utils if we had four X's and three Y's. That tells us that the additional utility from getting the fourth Y, since it took us from three to 3.78, is 0.78. And the marginal utility of getting a fourth X instead would only be 0.18. So which of these two would they prefer? That's question number one. Of course, they would prefer to have the Y instead, since it gives them more additional utility. So if they had to make that choice, hey, I see you've already got three hamburgers and three Cokes. I'll offer you one Coke or one additional hamburger. Which would you like? Of course, they would take the additional Y, which would be an additional Coke for this person. So that's question number one. Question number two. Can you express to me how much more intensely somebody would like the additional Y, the additional Coke, than the additional hamburger? I would say, well, this number, the, the Y, gives me about 0.8 additional happiness, and, and the X only gives me about 0.2. So we could say that the additional Y, I would prefer that about four times as much as I would like the fourth X. You see that? So if this is about 0.8, that's about 0.2. I'd like the Y about four times as intensely, four times as much as I would like to have another X. And that idea is gonna become important in just a minute. Now let's do a little bit more calculus here. Let's do partial derivatives of this utility function to get a function for the marginal utility of X and a function for the marginal utility of Y. This notation, personally, I'm not really interested that my students focus on memorizing this notation. But for a lot of people, you're going to see it at some point in your life, so I might as well introduce it now. If you're doing a derivative and the symbol you see is a normal looking D like this, then this is what we'd call a derivative. If you have a curly, this is a Cyrillic D, a, a D in the Cyrillic language, this curly D we use as a symbol for a partial derivative. A partial derivative is when you're trying to figure out the slope of a function if you only change one variable and you hold the other things constant. So here's how to do that in this case. If we have this utility function, x to the point 0.2 times y to the point 0.8, then the marginal utility of x, holding y constant, at what rate does my utility go up if I get more x's holding the y constant? You take the derivative of the part that has the x in it, you hold the part with the y constant. You treat it just like it is a constant number. In this case, since everything's multiplied times each other, then that means we're just going to multiply times the y to the 0.8, but not change it. We're going to take the derivative of the x to the 0.2 term. And what we're going to end up with is 0.2 times x to the, subtract 1 from the exponent, we get minus 0.8, minus 0.8 times y to the point 0.8. So 0.2 x to the minus 0.8 times y to the point 0.8 would be a function that tells us the marginal utility of x. All right, now I want you to pause the video and I want you to try it yourself. Find the function for the marginal utility of y. So if you've done this correctly, you should get 0.8 x to the 0.2 times y to the minus 0.2. So again, you're just taking the derivative of the y term, 
multiply by the point 8, and then subtract 1 from the y exponent. Point 8 minus 1 is minus point 2. And so what you can do is plug in to these functions any number of for x, any number for y, and it'll give you the rate, the slope, the rate at which marginal utility increases as you increase the amount of x or y that you're consuming. The big thing we're going to use these kinds of functions for, marginal utility of x, marginal utility of y, is what's really important is the ratio of these two ideas. And if you take the marginal utility of x, so just looking at this formula right here, the marginal utility of x divided by the marginal utility of y, that gives us something we call the MRS, the marginal rate of substitution. The marginal rate of substitution tells us how many y you'd be willing to give up to get one more x, keeping the same utility, keeping you just as happy. It also tells us the slope of a line tangent to an indifference curve at a point. And so if we look at these indifference curves down here for this utility function, and of course we're putting x's on the x-axis and we're putting y's on the y-axis up here, if we want to know the slope of one of these indifference curves at any point, we need to take these two functions, the marginal utility of x, marginal utility of y, and divide one by the other. And that'll give us a new function we call the marginal rate of substitution function. And that's going to be critical in analyzing utility maximization. I've already written these two functions we found up top here, and I've put the marginal utility of x over top the marginal utility of y. I've done that because what we're going to see here is that this is going to simplify to something that's very easy to look at. So what do we get here? We get 0.2 over 0.8. We could simplify that to 1 fourth if we wanted to. So we could either put 4 in the denominator, or we could put 0.2 divided by 0.8 gives us 0.25, which is the same as a quarter, and we could put that in the numerator. It's not important how you write it, as long as it's one of the correct ways. Now, let's just isolate the x's here and deal with those. The x's in this ratio, you subtract the exponents, right? So if we have x to the minus 0.8 and x to the 0.2 divided, it's going to be minus 0.8 minus 0.2, right? So what is minus 0.8 minus 0.2? It's minus 1. So what that tells us is that the x's in this ratio are going to simplify to x to the minus 1 or x in the denominator, 4x. And then the y's, we have y to the 0.8, divided by y to the minus 0.2, what's going to happen there? So it's 0.8 minus a minus 0.2, which is y to the first power, or y in the numerator here. Let me just go back and rewrite this the slightly more complicated way without simplifying those numerical parts, right? Let's just say we have 0.2y divided by 0.8x. Writing it this way helps us see where all the pieces came from, right? Now, if we go back and look at our original utility function, utility equals x to the point 0.2 times y to the point 0.8, there's actually a simple rule. If we're using utility functions that look like this, an x raised to an exponent times a y raised to an exponent, to make that a little more general, we could even have one that looks like this. A constant, like the number 5 or the number 3, times x to some exponent times y to some exponent. This general form of a function in economics we call a Cobb-Douglas function, Cobb-Douglas equation. And it's very useful for utility functions or production functions. There are many other choices, but this is a one that is fairly simple to use. 
It is realistic in some situations, but not in others. And it's fairly simple to deal with because if you look at a utility function like that has this kind of pattern, a Cobb-Douglas, the marginal rate of substitution function is very easy to just write down without going through all the hard steps of doing the derivatives that we just did. I have a video on that and I'll include a link to that simplification video if you want more details. But basically speaking, anytime you have a utility function that looks like this, constant times x to the a times y to the b, the marginal rate of substitution function is going to just look like this. It's the exponent on the x variable times y divided by the exponent on the y variable times x. The y and the x go with the opposite exponent. And as you can see from over here, it kind of has to do with us subtracting one from those exponents and then how it simplifies. Where does that constant go? Well, if we had a utility function that had a constant in it, then that constant would have appeared here in the numerator and here in the denominator, and they just would have canceled with each other. We're going to have a lot of occasion to use this simplification trick as we study utility maximization here. Now, why are we doing all this and why do we care? Again, the whole point is that we want to have a function, and it's really great that with a Cobb-Douglas utility function, it's always going to turn out to be something rather simple. Marginal rate of substitution equals, in this case, y over 4x. What it tells us is at any point in the space, what this space is, is how many x's we might have at a given time and how many y's we might have at a given time. What that marginal rate of substitution number tells us is, again, two things. It tells us the slope of an indifference curve at a point. It also tells us about what kind of trades a person would be willing to make. Let's pick a point. The point I want us to look at is let's plug in x equals 3 and y equals 3 because we plugged in some numbers before to see what happens to someone's utility at that point. Let's also look at the graph at that point, x equals 3, y equals 3. Now, if our marginal rate of substitution function is y over 4x, then what that tells us, number one, is, is that the slope at that point is 3, supposing we have 3y's, divided by 4 times 3. The 3's are going to cancel 1 fourth. So if we were to draw a tangent line, let me try to do that here. If we were to draw a tangent line that just barely snuggled up at one point right there to that indifference curve, that tangent line would have a slope of about one-fourth, negative one-fourth. But for me, I like to talk about marginal rate of substitution as a positive number, even though it is a negative slope. And we can kind of see that, yeah, 1 over 4 might be a reasonable guess, but we know mathematically that is the slope of that indifference curve at that point. We also know from our legend and from the math we did before that this indifference curve we're looking at here is the one where the person gets 3 happiness. So that indifference curve tells us all the different ways somebody could have 3 happiness. And 3x's and 3y's is just one of those ways. But here's the really, really important thing behind marginal rate of substitution. That one quarter also tells us how much y this person would be willing to give up to get one more x, keeping the same happiness. Now graphically, we can see that this way. If we were to move from this point 3,3, and someone offered us one more x, then how much y would this person be willing to give up, keeping them at the same happiness level? If we look at the red tangent line, it would suggest that if we go over one, we'd be willing to go down a quarter. However, indifference curves are curves. 
And so in reality, if we were to go over an entire one, meaning somebody was to offer us one more X, you see that moving to this new point on this indifference curve right there, that little green dot, would actually mean they'd be willing to give up a little bit less than a quarter of a Y. So curves are curves, tangent lines are straight lines, they're gonna give us slightly different answers. The long story short is that if we're at this point three, three, three X's and three Y's, that it, at least for small changes, we're willing to trade at the rate for each one amount of X you give me, I'm willing to give up a quarter of that amount of Y to get that amount of X. I wanna help us make sense of this. You remember when we were calculating these marginal utilities up here. Now again, this is using the subtraction method, not using the calculus method. Remember what we said here that at that point when we had three X's and three Y's, and we were trying to compare how much someone would like to get another Y versus how much they would like to get another X, we saw that the marginal utility of the Y was about 0.8, and the marginal utility of the X was about 0.2. And so that gave us this intuition that we would like another Y four times as much as we'd like another X. Well, if we flip that on its head, it becomes one quarter. That says that we would like another X only one quarter as much as we would like another Y. And that's what that marginal rate of substitution is telling us here. When we calculate that the marginal rate of substitution is a quarter. So just to wrap that up a little bit, marginal utility tells us the rate at which the utility of X or Y is increasing at a certain point. The marginal rate of substitution is the ratio of the marginal utility for X divided by the marginal utility of Y. And when we divide those two numbers or those two functions, we call it the marginal rate of substitution. And that marginal rate of substitution tells us the slope of indifference curves at a point, it also tells us how many Y's someone would be willing to give up or trade to get one more unit of X at that point. Now, of course, we see that since these indifference curves are curves, we see that the slope, the marginal rate of substitution is very different at different points. We see over here that we have a lot of Y and not a lot of X and the slope is steeper over here, which tells us that at this point, since I have a lot of Y, I'd be willing to trade a lot of Y to get one more X. If we have a medium amount of each, we see that it's a little flatter. And at this point, they'd only be willing to give up a quarter of a Y to get another X. And that has to do with their preferences. It has definitely something to do with the exponents on the X and the Y. So in a utility function like this, the larger the exponent tells us that ceteris paribus, they like y a little bit better than they like x. And the further we move over along a given indifference curve to where they have less y and more x, that slope is gonna get flatter and flatter, telling us that the marginal rate of substitution is lower and lower, meaning that they're gonna be less and less willing to trade Y's to get more and more X's. This pattern that we see here seems to make sense with human behavior. The more Y I have compared to X, the more Y I'm willing to give up to get more X. But the more X I have compared to Y, the less Y I'm willing to give up to get even more X's. So the marginal rate of substitution is getting smaller or diminishing as we move from left to right in this graph along a single indifference curve. And we call that idea diminishing marginal rate of substitution. Diminishing marginal rate of substitution, the slope gets flatter, your willingness to trade Y's to get X gets lower as we move from left to right where we have less Y's and more X's. And this video has gotten plenty long by now. So we're gonna stop here. And in the next video, we're gonna to continue to look at some more details about indifference curves
and marginal rate of substitution. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to try to be of service to you. Otherwise, I wish you the best of luck in your studies, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.